So, welcome Dev Madhav Prabhu. Happy to have you with us here. Thank you for having me. So, just, uh, you know, I have visited your center in Ann Arbor and it's a beautiful, beautiful, intimate community that you have created over there. And uh, especially for people with a more Western or Westernized mind, there are not many places where people can get a, get a sensitive and appealing presentation of bhakti. So maybe you could briefly introduce yourself and how, the, how you developed that, how you started that community. And then we could go on to a discussion on how the bhakti tradition can stay relevant based on talking about talking about say Indian mind, American mind, spiritual mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the um, my experience, I, I met um, bhakti practitioners in 2010, and I felt very inspired. I, you know, the divine had conspired to put me in a place in my life where I was really looking for an answer. And so when I came to the books of Srila Prabhupada, I, really, I found those answers. Prabhupada was ready to talk about the questions that everybody else would get upset with me when I asked <laughs> those questions nobody else wanted to touch. So after um, reading his instructions and associating with some devotees for some time, I went and started a, a place in Ann Arbor on the encouragement of some of the devotees at the Detroit Temple. And our initial idea was to be a place for people to come in touch with bhakti for the first time. This would be a place, as you mentioned, kind of comfortable for Western-oriented uh, mindsets to connect to the tradition, which can sometimes be obscured by tradition um, and something that seems to be Indian or Hindu, etc. Quickly, though, what we found, um, and the, the name of the community we call the Harmony Collective, we wound up becoming a kind of place for people who are already connected to the movement in some way to take shelter uh, because they hadn't felt connected or engaged in the ways they expected in other places in the movement. So it went from being a place of outreach to more inreach and giving the devotees who had been around for a little while but didn't feel encouraged for different reasons in other places to let them feel that inspiration to serve and really give themselves to the mission as they thought they would be able to. Hmm. Yeah. So this, uh, so basically since I started traveling abroad, I started in 2014, before that I was traveling in India. So I just realized how, especially when I came to Australia and then America, that Bhakti needs to be customized or to, to appeal to people and stay, and not just appeal, but to even be accessible. Otherwise, mm. in the initial enthusiasm, we may start off, some people may start off, but they will not be able to sustain themselves. Yeah. And I think that is a challenge for uh, every tradition, how it stays relevant. So now, Shila Prabhupada, the Bhakti tradition started from India, but Prabhupada started our movement in America. Krishna consciousness movement, and then he came back to India. So maybe, maybe I could talk about you know what I have observed about the Indian mind and I've experienced. But in general, maybe could you speak some things which uh, you had to tweak, or some things about the American mind, or in general the Western mind, because of which certain things needed to be tweaked, so that um, the presentation became accessible and appealing. Well, ironically, one of the things that it really appeals to a Westerner is the mission. You know, American nationalism, which in one sense looks like nationalism from anywhere else, Americans love their country, mm. and yet they see their country as a vanguard of a bigger idea, which is freedom. And so yes. American, America is equated with freedom. And so when you're defending America, you're defending freedom, this higher principle. So Americans are very attracted to this idea of serving a higher principle. And most of the people I know that joined the Krishna consciousness movement from a Western background, they're attracted to that idea of a movement, of a mission, of really doing something for the good of others and sacrificing them. All those things are, are natural um, for an American to be uh, allured by. The challenge is that in, in today's kind of modern expression of the movement, there's a very shallow idea of what it means to be a member. Basically, you just follow, you know, the basic rules of regulations around um, not doing any of the forbidden activities, so to speak. You chant rounds, you own a set of Bhagavatam and you keep them on your shelf 
and you go to the temple on Sunday, and that's the extent to which you're really asked to be a part of the mission. And so for a Western person, they want to live a mission-based lifestyle. They want to know that they're really contributing to this higher principle, but that's not really the ask anymore at the temple when you go, as, as opposed to 40 years ago when Srila Prabhupada was present and there was this, you know, the bar was set very high, that if you're not contributing to the expansion of the mission, you're really not even a part of the movement. So we, we really got back to that messaging at the Harmony, in the Harmony Collective. That's, that's what we focused on. And we kind of um, give less attention to the um, more temple-based experiences like deity worship and big festivals, et cetera, et cetera. We don't give so much attention to those things, which are um, more for a, a general congregation and many people from India who are just looking for a comfortable experience um, not necessarily a, a Krishna conscious one, but just something familiar to them when they come to the West. Those things appeal to them, but Westerners want to know that they're a part of the mission still. So we've really emphasized that, and, and it's worked so far, that, uh, at least for the group of, of devotees that uh, feel comfortable with us. That's interesting when you talk about America being a land of uh, liberty. Yeah, I have seen that in even the, if I read some American news newspapers or American magazines. I see that, yeah. that, that, that there is, of course, every country has its national spirit and uh, activism itself is quite big. I think among West, in the Western world, activism I have seen the biggest in America in some ways. New Zealand also yes. has seen it quite big, but in general. So even now the, the zeal for outreach is there in the movement, but often it is more in insider terms. Insider terms means, yeah. uh, you know, how big a temple we have built or, <laughs> or maybe how many books we have distributed. And sometimes these do not seem to be directly contributing to the welfare of the world. They seem to, mm. be, contrib they seem to be contributing only to the, the, the expansion of the organization in institution. Yeah, kind of points on our scorecard. Yeah, point on a scorecard, that's true. So. So is this a result of when you say that the movement is not exactly involved in these things or that is not highlighted now so much? Is that a result of historical circumstances? So the, now if I consider the uh, uh, American media or the American mind, broadly speaking, yeah that there is within america also there is political polarization between the left yeah, and the right so do does everyone share that activist mood now what i have seen is mostly people who are left oriented they come to us those are invited yeah. in some alternative yoga or sure. something like that people who are more right oriented they are usually affiliated with the, the traditional religions of the country that is mostly right. christianity so then if, if the people who are on the left, they come to us, they may not at all like a very strong authority structure because left mm. means you are a little subversive to authority. Yeah, and, uh, that's very true. Yeah. Oftentimes I say what brings Westerners to Krishna consciousness is what keeps them from Krishna consciousness, which is sorry, that sorry, what? What, what brings a Western person to Krishna consciousness is what keeps them from Krishna consciousness. That's clever. What do you mean? How, can you elaborate? The, the rebellious element is attractive, right? That I'm going to do something alternative. I'm going to do something that others aren't doing. But then when, as you pointed out, there's a natural hierarchy and authority structure within Krishna's community. And so when they face that, then that's also discouraging. <laughs> so they, they've come, but they're, it's hard for them to enter into a deep way, really surrendering themselves um, especially to a, an in-person authority, that's a hard thing for a Western person to, um, to stomach. To your, your points you were speaking about, I, I had this um, one thought that ultimately what we're trying to do is address impersonalism, this tendency to avoid deep relationships with each other. And so on the Indian side, you get the, the tendency to find escape in the ritual Right, the deity worship and the prayers and, and the whole ceremony of devotion. 
And then on the Western side, because of the influence of Judeo-Christian thought, impersonalism is expressed by over-glorification of the spiritual master and other personalities who are not in front of you. <laughs> Basically, the, the Jesus effect that our, our real heroes were way, way long ago, thousands of years, and we're all imperfect in this place. So we just have to kind of tolerate each other, but not develop real substantial deep relationships. And so the impersonalism has its effect on both sides. You know, I never thought of Jesus, that Jesus factor being a manifestation of impersonalism in a sense that you don't have to have a deep personal connection with the people immediately around you. That's right. In, in, some, way, <laughs> yeah, in some ways, that could also explain uh, Prabhupada's appeal then. Prabhupada was so high up as compared That's to right. everyone else that submitting to his authority was not that difficult. But after Prabhupada yes. departed, then submitting to any other authority became quite difficult. Yes, and increasingly, you're not Prabhupada, so I don't have to listen to you, becomes the, the mood uh, of, of people in general. And so this lack of cooperation in the name of Prabhupada, ironically, he wanted to see more cooperation, but in, in his name, we justify our lack of cooperation. So if... Uh, so then how do we deal with this specifically? So I have seen that in the West, even in the devotee community, the relationships are much more horizontal. Say if mm -hmm. I've seen a spiritual master deals with the disciples in India, it's much more vertical. Yes. Yeah, often, you know, the disciple will sit on a chair, uh, on, a, on, the, on the floor, the spiritual master will sit on the chair. But in mm -hmm. the West, the spiritual master and disciple, both of them meet. And uh, I, I, first, I had a cultural shock first time when <laughs> I'd gone to meet one spiritual master and his assistant was in another room. And normally, so then I needed something. I asked him, do you have a copy of this book? And he wanted to get the book. So he actually got up from his room and went to his assistant's room. Normally in India, <laughs> you just put a ring a bell or something and call. And then when yeah. he went to the other room, the, the disciple, the disciple and assistant continued sitting and was chatting. So then I was completely shocked on seeing that. And then <laughs> now neither of them, now the disciple was not being disrespectful and mm. nor did the spiritual master feel affronted by that. But mm. that was a, that was an unforgettable experience <laughs> for me about how the dynamics vary so much. Yeah. So how do we deal with uh, you know, giving instructions and following uh, and getting thing, people to follow things if we don't have a, we don't want to resort to authority structure? Yeah, I, I had an experience in Mayapur um, that, that I always look back to when remembering how to approach authority with devotees from the West, especially. We were in a workshop and the workshop was about mediation. So one devotee who she's a professional mediator and, and mediation has a certain etiquette. There's a kind of procedure to follow. And so she had taught us that procedure. And now we were going to model that with each other. So there was three of us. <clears throat> and then one person that was going to watch the mediation happening and, and kind of critique it and, and offer adjustments for the people doing the mediation. So I was my, in that group of four people, it was my service to first be the critiquer. So I was to watch the person mediating and give them adjustments and feedback. And so after the mediation you know, model, I started offering this um, the, the, uh, feedback to the devotee who'd been the, med the mediator. And she became very upset. She started getting very angry. And she said, who are you to tell me these things? You know, you're not, and then she referenced the devotee who was leading the workshop. <clears throat> you're not Vrajalila, you know, she's the one who's supposed to be teaching us and I don't need you to. <laughs> and then thankfully the other devotee stepped in and she said, Mataji, he's supposed to be doing this. <clears throat> she, she asked, you know, one person to, to offer feedback. So that's all he's doing. It's okay. And she's, you know, you, you see all her calm down, but she still didn't really appreciate or accept it. And so from that, I have a mantra that I tell myself that leadership should always be approached and never assumed that each time we go into the role of, of offering some adjustment for someone or, or hold any position of responsibility in their life, we have to approach that as though it's the very first time. 
And from in that kind of sensitive space, there's a chance we won't upset them. <laughs> Still, we might upset them, but we have, we, if we have any kind of entitlement towards our authority, you know, so-called over them, then a, a Western person smells that right away and they push back against it. Hmm. So when you say approached, that basically means we, in that particular interaction, we see what their mood is, how receptive they are, and then we present ourselves. So assume means, yes, this is the, this is the dynamic of the relationship and we start yeah, off I'm with the that. President, I'm the boss, I'm the husband, I'm the mother, whatever it might be. I'm in charge and you're supposed, you have to listen to me, that mood of entitlement. Mm. And the word entitlement usually has a negative connotation to it. Uh, yeah. And in the Indian context, they wouldn't call it entitlement. They would just call it, it would be considered to be, it's natural. Mm. So, yeah, right. <laughs> so, but. Uh, yeah, I've seen it many times where you have an, uh, an Indian devotee who's in a position of authority, say temple president or, or what have you. And they're approaching a new Westerner, somebody who's basically a bhakta. And so they'll tell them, they'll give them an instruction, wash the pots or, you know, whatever the instruction might be. And the Western person immediately gets upset. Like, who's this person who's telling me what to, I don't need to listen to this guy. I don't have to be here. And the Indian devotees think, I thought you're here to be of some service and to, you know, you said you wanted to do something for Krishna. So I'm asking you to do so. There's, there's a disconnect as to what the problem is. <laughs> mm. So, does this actually interfere with eventually people becoming committed? Because one of the challenges which we have faced, and I have been spending time in the West also, that when in India generally if somebody starts practicing bhakti and they start practicing bhakti seriously, you can assume that they are going to continue practicing uh, right. over a period of a long time also, almost lifelong. But it's, it doesn't seem to be like that. Even if somebody is practicing, they may not practice very seriously or they may not practice very sustainably. In the West, so, you're saying? In the West, yeah. So yeah. do we need to just uh, moderate our expectations of what level of commitment people may have during our Western outreach or over a period of time, people do become seriously committed? That's a very perceptive observation in my experience. Um, Oftentimes, what people are looking to run away from Maya more than they're looking to run towards Krishna. And when we come with Krishna consciousness, the religious presentation is very much, okay, you do these things, follow four regular principles, chant these rounds, read this book, and all your problems are now solved. And the experience that people have is that their problems are not solved. <laughs> in fact, their problems seem exacerbated in some situations by the practice of Krishna consciousness. And often the guide is tell, so, do those activities more than... And that doesn't that's seem right. The only thing that's wrong is that you're not doing those things right. <laughs> so you just need to increase those things and then it will solve your issue. And then again, it just exacerbates. It gets worse. So the chant and be happy, that's kind of where that idea comes from. And so we've started saying chant and be honest. That through chanting Hare Krishna and practicing bhakti, you'll gain the strength to face the difficult things in your heart. And it will still be difficult to face those things and your, your life will still have problems. You'll have an inner strength, though, that comes from the chanting, that comes from the practice, which will allow you to address those things in a healthy way. I remember there's a young woman, and she was sending me um, friend requests on Facebook. And because she was a single woman and we didn't have any friends in common, I don't accept those friend requests. But then I saw a message from her in my inbox, and it, was, it just said one thing. It said, why, when I chant Hare Krishna, does it feel like my life is falling apart? <laughs> And I started laughing <laughs> and I, I, I replied back. I said, that means you're doing it right. <laughs> and we, we have a friendship now. She's, <clears throat> she's begun to practice regularly. She's over in the UK. She's over in London. And she, um, she regularly hears Bhagavatam now. She attends some of our Harmony Collective online sanghas, etc. And once she was told that, yeah, it's actually a good thing that you're experiencing difficulty in your practice, it means that you're learning, you know, you're starting to, to clean the heart, Cheto Darpana Marginum, it, it reframed her perspective on what success is and allowed her to feel good about her practice. But when she thought that the practice was just going to, you know, bippity boppity bhakti, make everything bad go away uh, by the wave of the magic wand, um, 
that was disappointing for her until she had that expectation readjusted. Hmm. So what you're saying is that if your life is falling apart by chanting, it's not actually <laughs> that life is falling apart. It is that already the life is apart, but you, are, you, you confront it. That's chanting, no, be honest. You start, you start realizing. Yes. Uh, I think the Bhagavad Gita says, Sattvat Sanjayate Gyanam. In the mode of goodness, knowledge comes. So by mm. chanting, we rise toward the mode of goodness. And then yes. we can pursue uh, what is yeah. actually happening. And now from an way, institutional time, yeah, sorry, just to one more I, um, important idea to what we've been discussing in terms of the institution. Institutionally, it's very easy to tell somebody, just chant Hare Krishna, read Bhagavad Gita, and everything will go well. And the tendency of an Indian is to accept that and, and want things to look like they're going well. So even if they're not, they're going to continue to practice and, and kind of put on a show that it's working and I, I'm chanting and being happy. But internally, they're experiencing the same difficulties. So as a leader, then, it's easy for me to just pretend that everything is going well when internally people are having struggles and to have those down-to-earth conversations about what those struggles are and practically the work that it takes to kind of hold the person's hand as they walk through those, that takes so much. You can't do that for 300, 3,000 people if you're just one person. So in the, in the West, um, at Harmony Collective, our community, we're only about 30, 40 people in total. And amongst those, there's four or five people who really take responsibility for the relationships and the advancement of everybody else. And that's about all we can handle. Because when you're, when you're walking somebody through the thick of it, it takes that kind of attention that, that you can't offer to an enormous group. Mm. You know, this one point when you mentioned about Indians, uh, sometimes uh, if Indians already have some structure to their life, mm. they have a family, some family support, social support, a professional stability or whatever, then chanting gives them the strength and the particular challenge or particular wound they're, we are facing. If there is already a supportive structure, then chanting helps us to also access that supportive shelter, structure. Mm. So, but if there is no supportive structure, then chanting alone doesn't seem to help much. So it may yeah. not be that, uh, say, just the just the increased practice of uh, just increased practices are not solving the problem. They have the problems. I have seen many devotees who face some anxiety and stress, and they start chanting 64 rounds for a week or a month, uh, and they they seem to gain a lot of strength by that. So mm. it, mm. it can be that it works, but it's not only that alone that is working. So yeah, that, that's a certain level of faith that instead of hiding from Krishna or hiding from Maya, you're, you're going towards Krishna earnestly. That, that does work. That is the process. But that to actually have that faith, oftentimes it's not there in somebody. And this is another um, one benefit of Indians in general is that especially when they've come to the West, they're much more materially stable than your average Westerner coming to Krishna consciousness. They have a good job, they, have, they come from a supportive family, they were top academically in their country and that's what afforded them the opportunity to come to the West. So they're, they're generally much more um, put together persons. And so as you're saying, then when you add the Krishna element, it, it can do a lot more, a lot more quickly. But the average Western person's life is so topsy-turvy and the Krishna conscious experience seems like an easy escape route um, and that's not how it really works. It's actually so that you can get yourself stable and move towards Krishna with a desire to attain him rather than to avoid the difficulties of your material life. Yeah, you could also say that even the difficulties of material life can be of different categories. Mm -hmm. mm. It is more of a complete disruption of my life or it's, it could be a sense of incompleteness in my life. Mm. So if I'm reasonably materially stable, uh, mm. and then I feel that there has to be something more to my life. Then yeah. the one when one is approaching Krishna, that approach may be significantly different from, well, my whole life is falling apart. I need some, some support. So yes. then, the, and then also one might come seriously, but in, so relatively speaking, if one already has material stability and then they come to Krishna, 
then they are coming for Krishna for Krishna, Krishna for Krishna's sake. That's right. Whereas when when the when when material disrupted and that time one comes to Krishna, that's often for just protecting oneself from the consequences of that material disruption. Definitely. And then again, as soon as that material disruption goes down a little bit, or otherwise in the devotee community we experience some disruption then mm. we feel what did i come here for yeah right it's the same in here as it is out there so why bother that's interesting mm -hmm. and so i think that's also why prabhupad had this he he recognized and in so many of his purports he spoke to the idea of needing to approach the the higher echelons of western society that the kind of the low hanging fruit of those who are kind of disenfranchised and disillusioned by mat the material energy, they are attracted in, in the beginning, but they often go away. Whereas someone who's situated well in, in the, their sense of self in the material world, if they can be attracted to Krishna, it's something that doesn't leave them, as you pointed out with many Indians who begin practicing. And I, the same is the case for Westerners from that sphere who begin practicing but it's much more difficult to attract them because the external cultural elements don't do anything for them. <clears throat> mm. So I have, this is a good point. I have been talking with several devotees uh, across the world and almost all of them said that our movement has never really attracted mainstream Western people, people who yeah. are already well situated in respectable positions <laughs> in society. Is that a matter of our presentation or is it that unless that people unless they are looking for some radical alternative they will not turn toward us is it because of I mean, something we are doing wrong or is it because just where people are they're unlikely to explore us uh it's it's both certainly uh again yeah they're unlikely to explore us because they're they're thinking they're perfect powerful and happy you know they're well situated in the material world they're in one of the best countries and having a, a position within that country. So there's less impetus, there's less suffering. On our side though, uh, Tamal Krishnamaraj is a nice quote. He says, the world won't take you seriously until you take it seriously. So the kind of escapism that has passed as Krishna consciousness so often in the West, that's not attractive to a person who's capable in the world. They want to know that they're going to be allowed to make a difference. As I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, what Americans are attracted to. So if you can help, and, and University of Michigan, we had some success in our outreach there. Um, when we were able to sit and have conversations personally with the, the young people who are coming, they're going to a top university in the US and they have some ambition for changing the world. And when you help them see that the best way to change the world is through Krishna consciousness, then they take it and, and they run with it. And so I know of, there's about six devotees now that, that are from that um, era of our outreach. But I realized that we weren't going to be able to impact the whole campus of the University of Michigan and, and other such places in the Western world unless we created more social infrastructure that showed the value of Krishna consciousness. If we had gurukuls, if we had farms, if we had economic, um, opportunities for our the people of our communities that were real alternatives to the modern uh, industrial situation which most people recognize is not working then good thinking people would be coming to us but but for lack of that we just have a philosophy and a different way of dressing and you know some songs that we sing that you've never heard before and it doesn't really give that intellectual initiative for somebody unless they just have some piety you know that and that krishna connection is felt by them right away those are the people that are coming from those strata of society in the western world right now hmm. the two distinct points you made over here first is that uh, people are already comfortable and successful so they don't feel the need and if there are people who want to do something more they don't see us as the avenue of doing something more. We because say that the material world is Maya and it's all to be yeah. given up. <laughs> so let's look at both of these first. You know, even when people are relatively comfortable and successful, uh, still, if at all, now mental health problems are huge. So even mm. people who are successful are also not necessarily happy. Mm. But quite often they may not explore us. They may go mm. to they may go to maybe the religion of their birth 
evangelical Christianity is also quite strong in the in America. In fact, among all the first world countries, America is the most religious. So yeah. <laughs> Europe seems to be quite uh, atheistic. Mm, mm -hmm. Australia and New Zealand also not that aggressively atheistic, but still it is, uh, I would say if Europe would be at the bottom, maybe of course not all of Europe, maybe it's more like Caucasian Europeans. Uh, Islam has yeah. also come in quite a big quantity in Europe and they are quite uh, aggressively religious. So that's a different thing. But if you put Europe, then you could have Oceania, but America is at the top in the hierarchy. So people are quite religious uh, in the sense that are not those who want to be, they are. And I've seen uh, that many Christians, they are in respectable positions in society. They may not be intellectually respected for their Christianity, but there are many mainstream scientists who are Christians. And uh, right. so in that sense, if people are respectable, people are respectably situated, if they want something more, they are more likely to go toward the religion of their birth rather than come to us. Isn't it? True. Sure. And the second point relates with what you said that uh, we seem to uh, for, we seem to just reject the world and that's why we don't attract people. So here maybe I would like to contrast our outreach with Buddhism. Mm. In some ways, we introduce Kirtan to the Western world. Shri Prabhupada introduced vegetarianism to the Western world. And many of these, have, uh, they have become quite cool. Yeah. But uh, somehow, in the mainstream Western mind, Buddhism seems to be quite cool to accept. But... Uh, maybe some forms of yoga, but quite often yoga is also associated more with Buddhism than with the Vedic tradition sometimes in the Western mind. Very so true. is there some, even Buddhism has come from the East and we also come from the East. Buddhism also has this idea of the world being a place of distress. So in yeah. some ways it is also quite world rejecting. Mm -hmm. So what do you feel is the main difference? Means it, is it that our philosophy itself is intrinsically unappealing or is it something which uh, about our presentation. You were, you were mentioning, you are pointing out Buddhism and its popularity, which I think is a great observation that in the West, there's this comfort with Buddhism. And I, that comfort, although the present, they, they do beat us on presentation for sure. You, you go to a Buddhist temple and it's clean, right? You go to your average Hare Krishna temple and it's very um, unkempt, let's say. It's, it's just very like not... In general, it's very hodgepodge, even. We can use that word, just not what very you, orderly. What do you mean? Actually, ISKCON temples are relatively considered to be much more cleaner and aesthetically appealing as compared to most Indian temples, at least in India. So what do you mean by unkempt? Yes. Is it more in of India, the standard in India and the standard in America is very different in terms of cleanliness and aesthetic. So... If you, you go to your average ISKCON temple on a Sunday and there's all kinds of posters and all kinds of books and things, you know, people, things running everywhere. Um, people are dressed in all matter of different clothing. It's very, it's hard to make sense of. But if you go into a Buddhist center and, and the ones I've been to, everything is very clean. There's, there's very little stuff to begin with. And what is there is clean and orderly. There's mats set out, you sit down, it's very clear, I'm to sit in one of these places. So it's, it's understand, if you're a brand new person walking in, you, you kind of have a natural feel for where you belong and what's going to be happening. So <clears throat> without getting in, because that's another whole discussion, but I, I'd rather discuss the principles with you. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what appeals to Buddhism is that there's no person that you have to surrender to. And in bhakti philosophy, you can't get around without, you know, spoiling the, the actual philosophy, without um, adulterating the presentation. You can't get around the idea that you're meant to be surrendering yourself to a person. God is a person, and you're to, in order to connect and serve that person, you have to connect and serve one of his servants, the spiritual master. There's this emphasis on surrender to people. 
And in Buddhism, you're just surrendering to the void, you know, to the, the nothingness that we're all a part of. And so it's, it's very um, comfortable from that place because of that lack of personhood. Is it in terms of the emotional aspect of surrender or is it in terms of the rules and regulations specifically? Both, both. You know, Buddhism, what, what is the philosophy of Buddhism? Nobody can tell you except that ultimately nothing means anything. Right? So in the immediate, I can be doing anything and it's not a big deal. I can mm. still be eating meat. I can still be taking intoxication. I can still be sleeping with whoever I want to be sexually. And the same can actually be said for bhakti, but that's not the impression that people get. They get the impression that if you're hanging out with us, you have to be following these rules. And if you're not following these rules, you're wrong and you're bad and you don't belong here. Yeah. So a big challenge in the West and, and something we've done a pretty good job of at Harmony Collective is depressurizing the situation. But the real, the real power of bhakti is the positive. And if you take up the, the good habits, then the bad habits, they fade automatically uh, in due course of time. You don't have to actively you know, reject them so much as just try to connect more and more to the practice. But again, the religious presentation from the institution, that's not always how it comes off. It's much so, more so based on these kind of rules and regulations. Externally following them means you're a good person and not means you're a bad person. Hmm. So this is quite thought-provoking for me. The, the point which you made about not emphasizing the don'ts, what you should not do, what you should not do, I will, mm. I, I've been reading Buddhism and how Buddhist teachers are presenting. So Buddha, Buddhism has these three main causes of bondage, they say, or cause three poisons or three evils. So wow. it's translated as ill will or anger. Mm. Then there is illusion. And, and there is craving. So uh -huh. craving, ill will and illusion. Now, it's interesting in their ill will or anger, they talk about how we are destroying the ecology. This is a prominent Buddhist teacher I was reading. He was talking about how we are destroying the ecology, how we are insensitive to other human beings. It was almost a tract against capitalism of how mm. uh, workers are exploited. But an yes. obvious implication of ill will in terms of uh, meat eating yes. is not mentioned at all. Yes. So in that sense, it's a very non-demanding kind of spirituality. That's right. That's right. Although it's, as you're pointing out, the implications are there for any thinking person. How can you read that without recognizing that it's an indictment on so many of your personal habits? <laughs> but mm. in the West, there's this, there's always this cognitive dissonance. That's the wonderful element of the West is that you can pretend away the repercussions of your choices that the food I'm literally everything we're eating, wearing, driving, living in, using is causing suffering for so many other people. But we, we, you know, we whitewash it and we pretend as though those repercussions aren't there. And Buddhism, especially the way it's presented, allows for that same kind of cognitive dissonance, that fairy tale of I'm, I'm following a spiritual practice, but I'm not responsible for any particular principle. It's just based on my own inspiration and my own kind of creation of what it means to be faithful. Hmm. That's true. Another point about Buddhism is also that there is, it's more about, uh, you could say functional or pragmatic spirituality than philosophical spirituality. That's right. So yeah. sometimes I just couldn't, uh, when I, and I talk with Buddhists, I read Buddhist books. First thing that struck me was that it was so a philosophical, <laughs> so unphilosophical. Yeah, right. Over, <laughs> sorry? No, yeah, I'm just laughing at the way you're putting it. Yeah, but the, the point was, uh, for many people, that's what is appealing. Yes. I don't care about the nature of reality. What I care about is what will add value to my life right now. Yeah, just some stress relief. That's all they want. Just reduce the swelling, reduce the tension. <laughs> yeah. You know, I know I feel mindfulness can offer something more also. It can, if you can start thinking more about a deeper purpose for your life. So Naturally. stress relief is one thing, but still the point is you're not thinking about any ultimate reality. So, and in contrast with that, exactly. If you see that 
there is so much philosophy in our books and in our presentation but there is practically very little value addition to my life as it is now which is talked mm. about so in that sense yes it's people who are already philosophically interested they will they will immediately they will be those who are looking for philosophical substance they will be quite attracted to uh bhakti as as is presented by us but those who are looking more to add value to their life right now yes they may not be attracted now in no. contrast with respect to indians although we have a lot of philosophy we also have a lot of practices mm. and those practices add cultural value to the lives of indians mm. no i go to get to a temple go, go to go get to go to a temple i have something which my children can learn some verses some shlokas yes. they learn some culture especially in the west well the kind of cultural value that our movement adds to a, a average indian immigrants life in america that kind of value addition in this world sense is not there for western people to see it no. it is there in a sense but it is not there for them to see that's right it's more that it's more intangible sorry it's more intangible tangible and it's so now there is pragmatic spirituality and then there is where there is you, there is almost a utilitarian at, 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 at attitude towards spirituality where you know whatever exists out there doesn't matter i just care mm-hmm. about this world and whether it can help me improve this world improve myself mm-hmm. in this world so i call this sometimes something like a psychological version of karma kand <laughs> <laughs> karma kand was the idea that we get material benefits by worshiping god in terms yes. of we get a bounty if somebody not having a child they can have a child somebody gets agricultural crops or whatever but here psychological we get psychological bounty in the sense that my agitation goes said stress goes down i feel calmer maybe i become kinder i start forgiving more i learn to tolerate more so in some ways this maybe this is a approach we need to take but then there also as, as we caution that uh, we don't uh, we don't become reduced to a utilitarian kind of spirituality so what kind yes. of top yeah so I, I you, have, yeah go ahead i consider this a lot myself and and i love your we we actually have too much philosophy <laughs> we we have too much to to point to in that direction and it it again plays to that impersonal element that rather than getting into the nitty gritties of people's lives and dealing with them in an individual way we can just point to the philosophy oh it's your karma <laughs> for instance right instead of somebody's having a problem in their life and they want somebody to help them they say oh it's your karma so don't worry about it just come to the temple chan hari krishna distribute some of prabhupad's books give a donation and you'll be fine now if we look at the christians who you pointed to and, and you made the rightly that that's the natural kind of traditional spiritual community for a western person but also look at what the christians do to reach out to people they have hospitals they have hospices they run aa meetings if you get injured severely they'll send somebody to uh, your house just to sit with you and talk and and kind of help you get through the stress of that experience they have and all that these have a, that doesn't have an agenda to convert of course they do but people know that they don't mind because they're helping them <laughs> they're there to help them that's the first concern and then you know jesus is kind of brought in later and if the person accepts they accept and if they don't still they help the person in a very kind of tangible way so in our own communities that's one thing to consider is is how are we really connecting with people and and meeting them in the problems that they're considering but another element to that christian idea of and what you pointed to the lack of apparent practicality of krishna consciousness is that when you talk to christians they have almost no philosophy they have nothing to speak about but their own personal experience with christianity so their their pre- they call it testimony that they're yeah. testifying about what it what their life has become now that they're practicing christianity and in krishna consciousness there's this apprehension that because i'm not a pure devotee because i'm still contaminated i'm still dealing with my anarthas i can't share my own experience 
I have to share, you know, I have to talk the philosophy purely. I have to quote Bhagavad Gita. I can only say what Prabhupada says. And it's very intangible for the everyday person. So if we can encourage people who are practicing bhakti to feel empowered, to share what benefits have come to their life from the practice, that's the easiest way to get the everyday common person to recognize, oh yeah, maybe I can get that same benefit. Mm. So the, the philosophy, it's that it, we want to maintain the, the backbone being the philosophy, but we also want this element of testimony of the everyday man to be a, an, a permissible element of the culture of what it means to share Krishna consciousness. Fascinating. If you consider the time when Srila uh, Prabhupada was there, at that time also the same, uh, the hippies, most of the people who came to Prabhupada were from the counterculture at that time. So Definitely. there was an element of rebellion, there was an element of activism, and uh, he was <clears> able to <throat> attract people. So in some ways, that phase of counterculture is not there, but still that... Uh, uh, that phase of activism is still there, isn't it? Or that, that mood of activism is still there. But it's just... So what was it during Prabhupada's times that uh, that the, the rebellious or the activist mentality, we were able to connect at that time and we are not able to connect now? Well, in one sense, it's because at that time, the counterculture looked different. Um, there, sociologically... The hippie movement was a rejection of the, the golden era, which was the people right after World War II who enjoyed all this prosperity yeah. materially. And then their children said, no, that's not working. That's, that's boring. And that's, you know, that's pointless ultimately. So then there became all these attraction to Eastern ideas. But the underlying desire was still personal enjoyment, you know, my own sensual happiness. So that gave way to the hedonism of the 80s. They abandoned spiritual culture and just went all out with, you know, and you can look at it in the drugs and the music. If you look at the drugs and the music of the 60s and 70s, it was very like ethereal and soft. The, the major drug was marijuana and all the music had a very kind of like, so, yeah, soft tone. But then in the 80s, you have very heavy drugs like cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine. And you have rock and roll music as, as you know it today, this very loud, like banging almost, you know, obnoxious, jarring energy. And now after those two extremes of the love didn't work and hedonism didn't work, now you have where we're at today, which is just this kind of general apathy where people are just trying to get by day to day without feeling too harassed. So any ideal too extreme seems to be unnecessary and dangerous. And they're looking for something very pragmatic and down to earth. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember when I read George Harrison's biography by Joshua Green, Yogeshwar Prabhu. So mm. he says that initially he appreciated the counterculture and he spoke quite strongly in favor of it. But actually when he came to hate Ashbury and he saw, he, he later on regretted having endorsed yeah. it. And, he tried yeah. to, and even Prabhupada said that he wanted to distance our movement. Our movement shouldn't be solely identified with the hippie. So it seems that that downslide started from the 70s itself. So the early Definitely. 60s was more of the idealistic kind of uh, counterculture, but it, the downslide started thereafter. Mm -hmm. Because all those hippies, they sold out. The same, the hippies, they're now the CEOs of today's companies. So then your, your average 30 year old today looks and sees, well, that whole love thing doesn't really work. It's just another ploy for the same exploitation at the end of the day. And that person sold out like they, you know, they're angry at their parents, but now we're angry at our parents. So again, it comes back to that pragmatism. When you start flaunting very high ideals, it's the first sign for someone in today's Western culture. It's the first sign that you're going to cheat them because you're hiding behind this high ideal rather than being honest about where you're at in your own life. So this testimony is so compelling, whereas philosophy actually raises a red flag that this is just going to be some way to trick me. Oh, okay. So then if I can, we also have a lot of, lot of lofty ideals then. 
and that could lead so to so many yeah so, so it's many. not just that it is it's not just that this is too difficult for me it is also that i don't really believe that you are even you are doing this is it like that that's right oh definitely cuz look at the every day you know you meet the average devotee and now you you ask what's different in 1970 in 1975 you could point to shri prabhupad and shri prabhupad was such a sterling example such a contrast to the material energy not to say that there aren't pure devotees present today but shri prabhupad we know was by krishna's grace an exceptionally bright beacon of spiritual truth everybody recognized it in his presence and so we don't have such a person today to point to and that's you know that's not saying something offensive that's saying something clear that there is not a prabhupad to point to right now and for lack of that there's this hiding behind the philosophy and an unwillingness to speak about where we are as people and as a movement in an honest way but the the ethic of today for when you talk about millennials and zennials so basically uh, or or um not zennials um, millennials and generation z generation so basically z. anybody from age 16 to 35 the the young people of today and the the leaders of tomorrow basically the the group that we have the most opportunity to appeal to the the main ethic of theirs is transparency they don't really care who you are philosophically as long as you're honest if you're out in front about what what you're about that's what they appreciate and that things should line up who you say you are and what you're doing they have to line up perfectly even if what you say you are is not something very good from a moral or or value based sense if you're honest about who you are that wins you trust from a millennial or from somebody especially generation z the the younger generation because for so long leaders have touted ideals and philosophy and morality as a way to cheat people so if if the explanation doesn't meet the experience that's the standard of purity today that the explanation must meet the experience and if it doesn't then that creates mistrust that also gels with the more horizontal approach rather than the more vertical approach totally it? yeah totally i'm just an everyday guy like you i've been around 40 years so you know i i have some more wisdom but you know frankly i'm still just struggling like you are so nobody's too much more or too much less that's the western experience so even if it's not true you see that the the savvy spiritual leaders they still accept that idea because it's what allows people to trust them and and come close enough to recognize actually there is something different about this person they are unique to me but before that intimacy is established that being able to recognize it's not possible that means we need to first establish some kind of similarity before before we establish the dissimilarity is it yeah, that we sure. connect at a human level first for and sure. then we talk about the various spiritual levels of consciousness and how somebody might be at a more evolved level of consciousness that's right yeah totally uh, we could put it another way is that you know maybe authenticity comes before authority or authenticity <laughs> is the source of authority excellent yeah so, i like yeah. that a lot going back to what we spoke earlier right that authority must be approached by your own honest effort right not that you assume authority or that you are entitled to it but by your authentic desire to help that person that creates the authority of you in their life so do you see this happening actually in terms of you know, there are customizations happening and uh, are we able to reach western people at least in a small number in a small but yes. significant number you there, mentioned there earlier are. that the harmony collective has also become a place for devotees who maybe yeah. were not able to connect with the culture of the temple so but yeah. are we also able to reach out to younger newer people yeah i somewhere like the bhakti center in new york city is a good example of this hmm. they've been for for a decade and a half now uh at least they've been working very hard to crack the nut 
of New York City young people, and they've really tuned into something now. And, and there's a, a momentum that they've developed. And it's based around this dynamic of close, friendly, honest, interpersonal relationships. The, the young leaders there, Veera Bajaram and, and Jai Giridari and others, they're very affable people. They're very ready to, to get into a, a heart-to-heart conversation with anybody, whether they're off the street or somebody practicing Krishna consciousness for 20 years. And that openness is attractive. That openness is um, what, what reassures a Western mind that they're not going to get cheated by this person. Mm-hmm. This person's not trying to use some power structure to exploit them. So that, that's possible, but that work takes a long time. Again, the Bhakti Center, there, every, you might see now that there's so many young people coming and very enthusiastic and lots happening, but that's taken 15 years to develop. <laughs> it's, it's not something that happens overnight. So Harmony Collective, we've been around five years, and, and now slowly some other members of the community, aside from just like the, the very core are starting to understand what what it is that we do well, what it is that really attracts others to Krishna consciousness this way, and they're starting to be able to contribute to that dynamic. So hopefully in another five years, we can see a a larger community more mature and capable of kind of attracting a larger audience having built up. But right now, we're still very much in the phase of just taking care of the few precious relationships we have. Okay. Okay. So now, till now, I think we talked more about the, uh, we could say the cultural obstacles Mm -hmm. for the Western mind to appreciate bhakti. Are there any intellectual obstacles also that come up which need to be addressed? Oh gosh, yeah, scientific. Our, Our head has been in the sand for 30 years around modern science and Srila Prabhupada wanted that we address those things, but our, our culture really since the time of Sadaputta Prabhu, we haven't done much to speak to the, that situation. And so we're, we've really fallen behind there in even being able to have the conversation in a healthy way. Which area could we really contribute? Because in some ways, if you talk about the evolution creation, that's already a very polarizing thing. And mm-hmm. we don't really have uh, much to add specifically from our traditions perspective. You know, That's we could true. All, uh, so what I found is in science and spirituality, if you take the broad subject, consciousness studies is a big area. So I wrote a book That's... on reincarnation. I book a, wrote a book on mm-hmm. reincarnation and I spent a lot of time doing research and writing because I had the thought that <clears throat> what do we have distinct to offer? Actually, mm-hmm. the idea of God of course, we have a sweeter, more intimate conception of God. But at a mm-hmm. rational level, the conception of God is basically similar. So we don't really have anything strikingly more to add to that I just want to dialogue. So then I talk about the idea of the soul. So there is this interesting, polar, interesting polarization. You know, Christianity accepts the soul, but doesn't accept reincarnation. <laughs> right. Buddhism accepts reincarnation, but doesn't accept the soul. <laughs> 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 so it's puzzling what they say, what actually reincarnates they have some idea some accumulation of samskaras or something like that they say but the point is that i felt that uh, the soul and its reincarnation could be a distinct thing that we contribute to mm. the uh, to the mainstream dialogue to the mainstream discourse on science and spirituality mm. but i found that somehow reincarnation is is ranked among those far out beliefs which mm. include which include extrasensory perception which include astrology which include maybe clairvoyance and everything else like that so it it is uh, it is not considered really a respectable intellectually of course if you put it, it's in a spectrum if i want to put there's something like uh, in the alternative crowd, astrology and reincarnation are implicitly accepted. But in the mm-hmm. mainstream, we could say that for, for, for uh, extrasensory perception, there is some amount of acceptance. 
at least it's worth investigating you don't accept it but it's worth investigating mm. then there is near death experiences mm. and then there is past life memories because one mm. reason is near death experiences are also something which christianity accepts past life memories they don't accept because they don't accept reincarnation that's right so they don't Christian, have a... so christians have put in a lot of funds in near death studies a study mm. of near death experiences and there are for several professional journals peer reviewed journals a journal of near death or something like journal of nds so i had felt at that mm. time that uh, the soul and the reincarnation could be a way to enter into that space of science and spirituality but somehow now i felt that i could have spent the same time instead of writing on reincarnation writing on consciousness uh-huh. so buddhism has really done a lot of work on consciousness mm. and um, it seems conscious now, now of course consciousness is like the current main battle battle turf between materialists and non materialists yeah, there are even right. basic scientific researchers who say that uh, consciousness can be explained cannot be expl- reduced to materialistic phenomena to brain chemicals or whatever and others say that it can be reduced but at least it's a topic of discussion and we have something to add to that discussion so mm. that is one one major area i feel what 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 are your thoughts about this i i was going to ask you what what would you see us being able to bring to the consciousness discussion mm, three broad things first is that the whole concept of the subtle body and that is discussed more in sankhya than in art tra- and specifically in the gaudiya vaishnava tra- bhakti tradition but uh-huh. the main problem with accepting the idea of a non material source of consciousness within mainstream science is that how does something non material interact with the material without mm. violating the laws of material nature mm. because in some ways material science considers the laws of physics as sacrosanct as inviolable that's mm. right and they say that uh, you know so and it's not it's essentially wrong also because causal completeness that every material phenomena can be explained in terms of material causes that is one yes. of the grounding assumptions of science so that area of how it could be explained that how can some non material unit source of consciousness affect a material body without mm. violating the laws of physics that our whole concept of uh, maya no so the one of sadaputra's last book was maya the world as a virtual reality so there he mm. gives the example of how mm, when we play a video game you know we we may just press some buttons over here but mm. we are not actually entering into the digital world <laughs> right so what whatever happens in the digital world happens by the laws of digital logic or whatever you want to say mm. but our influence is there on it so say if somebody is playing a video game certain things happen automatically certain things happen volitionally we make them happen mm. and but within the parameter of the video game everything is working according to the laws of the video game but we have a capacity to intervene over there yes so so the so the enemy might be shooting the enemy is a robot or whatever the robot is shooting in a particular way and i am shooting back so now i am using my intelligence the robot is basically shooting back according to it's programming but yes. within the video game the two of us are interacting almost at a equal level mm. so <clears throat> i think that is a big area where how a non how a conscious being could actually interact with a uh, with matter without violating the laws of nature with through sankhya we could explain that in a significant way yeah i like that and the elements the intelligence mind false ego yeah the concept of those is a nice as an interface the software so to speak i like that yes that's interesting you mentioned so you said three things so there's two others okay so with respect to with respect to consciousness studies that's you know actually i was talking about three areas the existence of god the second was mm-hmm. soul and reincarnation third was consciousness Uh-huh, so okay. consci- consciousness itself is the most relevant for us and yeah. the soul and the incarnation is what i worked on and existence of god you know i i have not seen that as a major obstacle for people 
Now, if people are atheistic or especially maybe they are anti-theistic, they are aggressively atheistic, then they will not even come toward us at all. Yeah, that's right. So, so establishing the existence of God rationally, it does not. Rec- that is not something which is a very very pressing need for us. Mm. It is of course required, but people who have some kind of spiritual inclination will come to us already. So. Getting into the evolution, creation, confrontation, sometimes uh, that can alienate more people than attract. Absolutely. And that's, that would be my answer to your question is that it's not really necessary to discuss these things with most people. It's because when, again, the emphasis on discussing our philosophy, the irony of all the emphasis that we put on philosophy is that most people don't have any philosophy in their life right now. So when you give them a philosophy, they don't even know how to interface with it. It's very intimidating. It's, it's practically threatening to them. Something like giving a child a, a sports car. It's a sports car, but the kid doesn't know how to drive it. So what, what good are they going to do? So we present a philosophy. People aren't looking for a philosophy. They don't have one to begin with. They don't understand the value of the philosophy. So getting back to personal experience, that's what they're really wondering. What's this going to do for me? So when we bring in these controversial issues that weren't even necessarily invited in, <laughs> then it just antagonizes them that much more. Hmm. When you talk about people not being philosophically minded so much, now in general, if I see, say, the intellectual level of a New York Times editorial, as compared to a Times of India editorial. Mm. I do find that the NY Times is more, much more, much deeper. The analysis is deeper, broader as compared to India, uh, an Indian news, equal, equivalent Indian newspaper. And they also discuss, uh, I saw in the current Corona crisis, I saw an article on the moral meaning of the plague. So, uh-huh. which is quite interesting, the way they spoke it, moral meaning of the plague. So the idea is that uh, there are people uh, who are also very thoughtful and they are considering yeah. these issues, but maybe they are not the kind of people who come to us. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. It's it also is. it's an intellectual exercise for so many people because, you know, it's, it's just like playing a video game for them that they'll read this article and it's from the New York Times, so it feels good. Um, They can say something cool while they're at the bar, out with friends. They can reference this article and it makes them seem, you know, intellectual. But an intellectual, at least the the Puranic, the Vedic version of intellectual, means that you have integrity to the knowledge which you're taking in, right? That that there's an implication to the knowledge and you're responsible to that implication, the austerity of knowledge, tapo gyan. So as, as you pointed to earlier, the description of Buddhism and, and the clear implication is that you should not eat meat, but how few people take that on when they're reading that material. So that it's so easy in the West today to just uh, interact with something in this impersonal way to use it for your own purposes. And I think that's where a lot of the intellectualism comes from also. So again, when you get into those intellectual debates, there's always somebody else that said something else that somebody can quote. And the authority structures are, you know, horizontal. So the New York Times and the um, India Times and the Bhagavad Gita, they're all the same. (laughs) So then it comes back to your own personal experience. And that's something that people can't refute. I experienced this when I chant the Maha Mantra. Who can tell you that you don't? When you say, Prabhupada says, when you say, the, the Bhagavatam says, then they can refute that. But when you say, when I chant Hare Krishna, this is how I feel, they're not allowed to tell you by the ethic of modernity, they're not allowed to tell you that you're wrong. So we need more devotees, more people having the experience of Krishna through these mediums of the Bhagavatam, the Holy Name, etc., testifying personally that it's happening for me and it can happen for you. The only reason it's not is that you're not doing it. <laughs> When you say that uh, there's a gap between intellectualism and like something is just read for intellectual titillation, on the yeah. other hand, you also said that people value authenticity. So that's right. Isn't that uh, there's two different things? They seem contradictory. Value. 
Yeah. So again, often the, the bar for authenticity is very low. It's, it's not that you're being authentic to a, a certain value. It's just that you're telling people where you're at. I'm trying to think there's, okay. you know, Trump is a living, breathing example of this, that he's a roaring contradiction in so many ways, but because he just kind of, you know, speaks from his heart, then people accept it. Although there's so many contradictions flying all around him, if you look at the words he's using, because he's kind of unabashed about who he is, then people accept it. That's a good example. I never thought of Trump as an example of authenticity because <laughs> he's presented in such a negative way in the media. But yeah, yeah. It, who he shows is who he is in many ways. He doesn't who I am is who I am and deal with it. And so many people love that. Even the people that hate him hate that that's how he is because that's how they are. <laughs> and it's just not working out as well for them as it is for him. <laughs> what do you mean? That's how uh, the way they are, the way he is, the way they are. Because many others are quite politically correct yeah, the, and moderating their speech and everything. Well, that's. They're political. Well, you, I'm sure you've you've seen those criticisms of the left that they they judge everybody else about their judgments, and in that way they're judging also, right? Yeah, that, of course. That, and, and so the the accuser becomes the abuser, and so the the left is just the other side of that authenticity coin that we're going to do everything perfectly. But if you don't do things as we do to, in order to honor you, but if you don't do what we do, then we're not willing to honor you. So they're they're a roaring contradiction, much more so than Trump is in that way. Hmm. That's true. So again, all of this plays back to my, it's, it's just my personal realization over the last year and a half or so, that we have to bring in this element of testimony into the bhakti culture. And it's, it's interesting when you, the, the praman, the, the scriptural, um, a uh, pastime history that I, I look to for this is that famous exchange between Vyasadeva and Narad. When Vyasadeva yes. is told by Narad that you didn't talk about Krishna enough and that's why you're feeling bad. So talk about Krishna more and then everything will work. And then the very next thing that Narad Muni himself does is talk about himself. Mm. In that passage of the Bhagavatam, he goes from chastising Vyasadeva, not glorifying Krishna directly, but then Narad himself begins to share his own story in Krishna consciousness. He begins to testify to the effect of bhakti, that direct connection with Krishna in his life. So Krishna is being directly glorified, but through Narad Muni's personal experience. And this is the, the synthesis that's missing right now in our communities. We're glorifying Krishna by, by the Bhagavatam, by Prabhupada, by the, by the past histories of great efforts of devotees, either it be Prabhupada's disciples or the Bhagavatam, etc. But we're shying away from sharing what's going on in our own personal lives, the magic that Krishna is bringing into it. And if we learn how to share that in a healthy way, where it doesn't compromise the philosophy or put ourselves on a pedestal we don't belong, but at the same time gives the everyday person a way to see themselves in that practice and how they could benefit from the same experiences then that's the magic that will get the movement happening again. Yeah. And I think this will have to come more at an individual level than at a collective or institutional level. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Well, what you're doing right now, I mean, you're a great example of this. So many people love your Bhagavad Gita daily discussions. And it's because they can see you're having these realizations. These are things you're churning yourself. Oh, you're reading an ancient text, you're taking the wisdom of the Acharyas, but then you're, you're trying it on in your everyday life. You know, you're putting your specs on and then you're describing what you're seeing to people and people really appreciate that. They love that down to earth um, experience of these high philosophical ideas. Mm, thank you. I think that's what you are also doing in your own way, in a quite an effective way over there. So... Maybe we'll try to summarize, and then if any threads are remaining, we'll try to take them up. Sure, sure. So, uh, basically, when we discussed about broadly 
re- keeping the bhakti tradition relevant or doing western outreach so mm. i started by discussing about the differences between mainly say the difference between say the indian mind and the western mind and mm. the approach is required for that so one aspect was the horizontal vertical then you talked about authenticity being very important and then we we mentioned also that with respect to the culture people have a sense of activism and missionary and in terms that they can see in the world so how does yeah. whatever i practice add value to my life and add value to the world and in totally. some ways we seem to be quite insider in our definitions of adding value and quite world rejecting very abstract, very abstract. Quite abstract. Inter- yeah uh, now that doesn't apply so much for indian immigrants because cultural value gets added to their lives and for the yeah. western people they don't really care so much for the culture so it's what will the culture do for me the culture doesn't have intrinsic value the culture they have to look divide from the if if the culture had intrinsic value they would probably go to their own their own religions of birth or whatever yes so christianity often christianity and buddhism we discussed relatively speaking uh, that christianity and buddhism both are quite utilitarian in own, their own ways so something like a psychological karma kanda not focusing mm. so much on the philosophical aspect and sometimes we seem to f- focus too much on the philosophical aspect yes and uh, then uh, you mentioned about that in christianity that emphasis on testimony a lot and uh, that personal experience of people because they don't have philosophy they focus on experience and somehow that and that appeals to people so in our yes. case uh, it did that uh, you mentioned about impersonalism coming out with indians in terms of the hindu of uh, uh, the focusing on rituals and practices a lot whereas in the west it comes on creating a jesus figure and offering the reverence to them but then equality so to some extent that has happened with prabhupad also but then mm-hmm. you authority but then subsequent authority structure is not that respected so the very thing that brings people to krishna also keeps them away from krishna that rebellious mentality they rebel against their authority structures but when they encounter authority structure here that becomes difficult so authority needn't be assumed it has to be approached and cultivated mm. and then uh, with respect to intellectual obstacles discuss about scientific so the evolution creation is is large not only irrelevant it's unproductive because we don't have anything special to add to the discussion and can counterproductive because it just it's so polarizing and soul and reincarnation is you, we have something distinctive to say but where the current uh, mainstream mind is is the is the is consciousness studies and then toward the end you mentioned about how wherever the models are working it is more through personal relationships where you help people at an individual level we help people to grow spiritually and it's when that happens that's what helps the community to gradually grow and it is gradual so any other points you felt which are salient no that's a wonderful summary <laughs> i'm so glad we covered all that <laughs> oh, yes so thank you very much for joining today it's yeah, been wonderful thank- talking with you love to see you i'm glad you're safe over there and uh, please keep us all enlightened with uh, continuing to share your realizations oh i'm happy to be of service in whatever way i can and thank you so we look forward to having you in a few sundays at harmony collective over zoom sure <laughs> we're happy to all be right. there